All right, what's going on, everybody? We are back with the second episode of The Wave Report, um, where I'm just going to just go over general topics of the week that we've heard of this past week since last week. Last week was the first time me doing it. It's no different from what I've been doing with the channel, just making videos and making content, just talking about different boxing topics. But I actually gave it the name, and the name is going to be The Wave Report, and this is episode two. Um, week two. So um, we're going to go over a number of topics. Uh, so if you don't know already, this weekend we have Frank Martin against Michelle Rivera. All right. Very good fight. I did a breakdown for the fight. If you haven't seen it already, please check it out. And you know what? Check out the other videos. Check out the other channels that's made content on this fight. Uh, I see that um, my man Boxing Gems did a breakdown, a film study of the fight weeks ago. You know, he's really early on it. Um, I seen Punch Perfect Box in his channel. He's done uh, a pretty good breakdown of the fight as well. All right, so any boxing channel that's promoting the fight, talking about the fight, definitely hit them up, watch their content. There are, are channels still making content on actual boxing and just not boxing drama. So please support the channels that are doing breakdowns, that are actually talking about the fights, you know, and giving you news, boxing news, the right way, you know, not just with biased fanboy talk. So, um, you know, and I feel that, unfortunately, I feel like, you know, those channels are not getting the credit or the views they deserve because they're not gossiping on day. All right. So um, be sure to check out the fight. It's going to be on Showtime this weekend. I'm not going to be able to do live commentary for the fight tomorrow. All right. But as soon as I get back home or possibly early first thing uh, Sunday morning, I will do a review, a post-fight review of the fight. It should be a really, really good fight. All right, so check out my breakdown. Also, also, I did purchase a ticket for Anthony Yard against Arthur Better BF. It's going to be in London. It's going to be in the UK. It's going to be in the OVO, uh, Wembley Arena, and I'm going to be right there, all right, sitting ringside for the fight. So, um, I'll see you guys there. For the people that's out in the UK, I will see you guys out there. Uh, shout out to Punch Perfect, Jamie from Punch Perfect. Uh, I, had, I hit him up, and he's actually going to the fight too. So I should be able to link with him there, and we we, we will probably do it a joint video breaking down the actual fight. All right, pretty soon. All right, so um, let's talk about boxing news. Let's, all right, so this is not live. This is not live because... um. I wasn't going to be able to sit around and chop it up with you guys. I didn't have the time. I wanted only to do a really quick report today. Um, but I just want to start off with Lawrence Okoli and Eddie Hearn. Their battle, their beef been going on for some time. And I haven't really covered it on the channel. But I've been keeping my eye out on it and paying attention. And, and, and I'm just going to say this. And this is a, a general statement. This is how I feel about all boxers, boxers from the past. I mean, I've been on YouTube for a really long, long time, and I think the first time I might have covered a boxer that had an issue with their promoter, where you know it it went it it went the legal route and it turned into a legal battle, and the fighter ended up not having a fight for a few years was Mikey Garcia. Okay, um, I remember covering Mikey fights before the issues with Bob Arum and Top Rank. And it ended up making Mikey sit out the ring for two to three years or something like that. We didn't see Mikey Garcia fight, you know, and these are in, in his prime years at the time. I believe Mikey was at 126 at the time. These were his prime years, you know. I mean, he was still really good after that. And he still made a lot of money after that. But when it comes to Lawrence Acoli, I like him a lot. The reason why I'm talking about it today is because I saw the video from Sparring. Alan Babbage. And I like Lawrence Okoli. I really want to see him fight the top cruiserweights, you know, if he stays at cruiserweight and move up to bridge weight or whatever he decides to do. I really like Lawrence Okoli. My only issue is when it comes to these, if it was me, and I know I don't understand, I don't know all the details about this because it hasn't gone publicly. I don't know all the details on why him and Eddie have issues, okay? And I don't want to base it on the reports we got, you know. Um, I just know some of the comments, you know, the slave comments and stuff like that. Look, 
I feel that when you are in contract, if you are in contract with a promoter or a network or whatever it is, if you are in contract, and I feel that if you are having issues with your promoter, it's nothing wrong with going public, okay? There's nothing wrong with going public. It happens all the time. Devin Haney just said a couple of days ago, they're trying to stretch out the Lomachenko out to May. I want to fight on in March. I'm not trying to stick around at 135. There's going to always be issues with boxers and promoters, and boxers are going to say things about their promoters in interviews. But I feel that if you are in contract, especially if you have like one fight left on the contract, I think that everything you do, you got to be very careful about things you say, you know, because it can be used against you, especially if you're threatening to go the legal route and um, sue, you know. Um, I think you just got to be very careful. I know we get frustrated and I think we go to social media or we have interviews where we say certain things out of frustrations because it is your boxing career at the end of the day. And if you feel you're not being treated fairly, I understand the frustration in that. But I also think that you have to be have a little bit in control of control and be very mindful of what you say, especially if you're going to go into litigation, because whatever you say could be used against you and you don't want to end up getting countersued for defamation if you can't prove all of this. That's what I'm worried about. Not saying that Lawrence is doing that because I don't know what the outcome of all of this is going to be. They might not even have to go to court. I don't know how this is going to end. I know that it's definitely probably screwed up the relationship he had with his promoter. But at the end of the day, that's something that can be handled, especially when you finish your contract, have your last fight, and then you can move on and resign with someone else. While you're still in contract, you make things a little bit more difficult, especially when trying to get that next fight in. You know, that's even if you want to have that next fight with Matchroom. But as far as you being your contract, you're you're obligated to have the fight under that contract that you sign. And I think things can make. It's not it's not about being wrong or right. It's about the the you making things more difficult. Because you're still signed with them. You know? It's like with Terrence Crawford's situation recently. Him suing Bob Arum. I don't know where that's going to lead. I don't know how that's going to end. But I know that Crawford waited until after his contract was up. Before he came out to sue Bob Arum. You know? And he waited. The frustrations was there. I mean, Bob has said comments about Bud publicly for fights for it's been a few fights you know but some of the things he said he used all of that he built up all that to, to make a case you know backing up what he was saying whether you agree with it or not in this it seems like you're still on the contract you still have another fight and you are going to go take this to court if you are you don't want to say too much publicly just my stance on it you know sometimes we get frustrated i know i get frustrated over certain things not that i'm in his situation but there are certain things that i get frustrated about but i have some kind of control of what i say publicly because i don't want that to come back to bite me in my ass and i hope that doesn't happen with him i don't have nothing against eddie and i have nothing against lawrence acoli but looking at it from the outside end i just kind of wish lawrence waited until after that last fight then sue him for whatever it is that you're suing him for. All right. And that's it. I'm not going to all the details because off top of the head, I, I haven't followed it back to back to back every time the news, the reports came in. But based on looking at it in general, in general, I just be really cautious of what I say or what I do while I'm still on the contract with that promoter. You know, just based on the history of this sport. I don't want this dude to get jammed up in his prime years and not be active. And that sparring session I saw the other day kind of made me feel that way. I'm like, damn, I, I want to see him back in the ring. You know, I don't think he always had the best performances. And I've said that. I've been fair. Like, I think there's 
periods there was fights where he overperformed and then there was fights where I thought it wasn't that good but with that being said he is one of the top guys at cruiserweight and I want him to fight the best and there's a lot of fight that out there for him even if he moves up still a lot of fights out there for him all right so um that's my stance on Lawrence Coley let's move to the next topic um and, and I want to start with talking about 126 a little bit all right um 126 what's happening there's a lot happening there and i i have my notes down here but for whatever reason i think i deleted some of the things that i said but really what i wanted to talk about is this division and i've made so many videos complaining about 126 and all of the fighters there and the lack of unifications there you know a lot of lack of fights that could have been made with 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 you know PBC, you know, Leo San Cruz being the bulk of, of the issues. Um, and that's what really, why, what motivated me to make this video. Leo Santa Cruz finally vacated his title at 126. He was holding this belt for almost four years. All right. The WBA title, the last time he defended it was like February of 2019. We're close to February of 2023. It'll be almost four years. Since he actually defended that title, he's gone up to 130 and had a few fights up at 130. All right, losing, getting knocked out by Tank Davis, still being a champion at 126, not defending the title. Okay. Meanwhile, in the IBF, you have guys like Joe Cordina who gets stripped after winning the title, getting stripped right after because he had an injury leading towards the next fight. You know, um, I know that's a different section and body. A more strict sanctioning body but it just goes to show the inconsistencies and how the sanctioning bodies could ruin this sport it, it is it's like you have these titles you know you want fighters to become title you know champions we want them to become unified and then we want them to become undisputed we want them to have title defenses but we keep having these things that's causing these fighters to not reach that kind of greatness and it's unfair because you got a guy like Mauricio Lara, you know, knocks out, knocks out Josh Warrington, knocks him out, go into a rematch with him. The fight ends off early due to a head clash, right? A head clash. And Josh doesn't win against Lara in either fight, but he goes on to fight Kiko Martinez and beats him and wins another title without Mauricio Lara getting a title shot. It's just it's just ridiculous how this sport is. And I understand Lara is not the superstar. I know he's not the name. I know he doesn't put butts in seats like the way Josh Warrington does. Clearly, we can see that. But if we want the best to fight the best, you know, if we want the guys that really earn their position in this sport to be champions... You can't just keep cutting corners like this, you know? Um, and this division has been one of the worst divisions when it comes to, to the best fighting the best. I've always, I've, I've, I've call, I call it a, a pit stop constantly, you know, because a featherweight division historically has been a great division. But at this point in a past decade, we don't get none of the champions fight each other. Everybody's cutting corners. And then when they get to a point where there's a tough challenge, they'll move up to 130. You know, they'll fight an easier, bigger man at 130. That's what they do. That's what they do. You know, or they'll fight a more difficult fight like Leo fighting Tank Davis. But because Tank is a money guy, you know, they're, they're more willing to go up and get knocked out over fighting another top guy and their current division i understand it's prize fighting you're in there to make money and stuff but i don't want to do all this legacy talk if you're just going to cut corners and risk getting knocked out instead of it's, it's no different from mikey garcia and what he did and and going up to fight errol spence and avoiding lomachenko you avoided lomachenko you know a guy with a name but it's a tough fight and you avoided him to go and fight a welterweight when you were unproven as a welterweight 
You didn't even really fight at 140 for long. Oh, you didn't fight the best at 140 when you moved up to 147. You didn't fight the best at 135 before moving up to 147. But that's what you did. And you got dominated. You lost every round against Errol Spence. Forget what you see in Spence. It's about what you can prove in the ring. And he didn't prove anything. Fight went exactly as predicted. You know, now back to 126. You have a lot of guys here. I don't believe Leo stays at 126, but it looks like now that he vacated the title, wasn't stripped, vacated, meaning he gave the belt up after not defending it for years. The WBA never stripped him, you know. But with that being said, Lee Wood is probably going to be elevated because he's the regular champion. This is the Lee Wood that knocked out Mike uh, Collin earlier this year. Right, so he knocks out Colin. Great fight, one of the best fights of the year. Might be number one, and um, you know he's still the WBA regular champion. Now they were gonna do other fights. There were talks about having other fights, but listen, at this point at 126, I really don't mind how these fights go and play out. Excuse me, as long as the best are fighting the best. If you take Mauricio Lara. If you take Josh Warrington, who has made it clear that he's not going to retire after the loss to Luis Alberto Lopez the other day. If you take that fight, you take Warrington, you take Conlon, who won the other day too, got a scored a, a first round knockout, right? You take Conlon, you take Wood, you take Lara, you take Warrington. And you take whoever's left. I don't know what Mark Masayo is doing. I haven't heard anything from Ray Vargas. You know, since the Ray Vargas loss. Ray is going up. He's another guy that's going up. And you guys, that's you got new guys coming in, right? You got Stephen Fulton. He's supposed to be moving up to have a rematch with Brandon Figueroa. But regardless, you have a lot of fighters out there, a lot of good fighters. Let's get some of those fights done. Let's not just keep being safe. Everybody's moving around. I mean everybody. I'm not I'm not I'm not singling anyone out. You got Navarrete, love Navarrete. If he's gonna go up to fight, well, that's the that's the next topic. And we're gonna go right into the Navarrete um situation. But you got Navarrete who was at the division, held a belt at the division, but now he was supposed to go up to fight Oscar Valdez. Right? So we can't count him because that title is gonna be vacated. So what I have a problem is with this division is that people are coming up, winning a title real quick, you know, having that one title shot, usually a safe shot, usually it doesn't mean they're fighting the best at the division, and then fighters are just moving up, you know, and we're not getting any unifications, even for the fighters that staying in the division, they're not unifying. You know what I'm saying? So Lopez, let's get a Lopez against a Lee Wood or a, a Mick Conlon or or or, or 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 Gary Russell or you know any of these guys. You know, a Fulton or a Brandon Figueroa. Let's get these fight for 2023. Let's at least get one unification because I don't believe there's been a one unification since since like a decade. I think I checked this maybe like six months ago when I talked about this. There hasn't been one in, in like a decade. And there's been plenty of opportunities to make them. You know, because you had some of them on the PBC, these champions, you know, over the years. You had guys like Frampton there, Gary Russell there, um, um, Leo Santa Cruz there over the years. You know, recently Ray Vargas, Mark Masayo. You know, you've had guys there, you know, but you also had Eddie. Eddie has some guys. ESPN has some guys. Let's work it out. Let's work something out. You know, let's make some of these fights. These are, is a lot of talent. There's been a lot of talent stopping by this division. And some have stayed. I don't care how they mix these fights up. Warrington's going to stay. Let's get a fight with him. You know. Let's make it. Let's make it happen. That's all I'm asking for, you know. Um, Gary is not even young no more. I've been I've been watching him and making videos about him since he was a prospect. You know, 
since he was a prospect. So with that being said, I want to be, I mean, even live fights. I've seen them live knocking people out. I, I just, I'm just waiting to see what these guys can really do. You know, I know Shakur was there. Shakur was there for a short period of time, um, coming up as a prospect, winning a title. But he's moved up and unified, you know, at 130. And now he's running around chasing these guys at 135. All right. Not saying, you know, I mean, I mean, he won. I know he wanted the Valdez fight at 126. I don't think he was really interested in a warranted fight at 126. But regardless, regardless, I don't know if that fight was going to really happen or not at 126. But at least he moved up and took bigger challenges. You know what I'm saying? These guys are 126. I don't know what they're doing. You know, they're just moving around real shaky. All right. And I'm kind of getting annoyed by it. And I think it's just doing a disservice for not only the fighters, but the boxing fans, too. We got a lot of talent here. We can make better fights than the ones that we're getting. All right. And let's pivot right over to the Emmanuel Navarrete Oscar Valdez fight that we were supposed to get in February, but we're not getting it because Valdez suffered a undisclosed injury. We don't even know what kind of injury or nothing, but he's out of the fight. And now what's going to happen is Emmanuel Navarrete is going to end up fighting the third ranked fighter of uh, the division or the WBO because Emmanuel Navarrete is currently the WBO champ at 126. So now that he's moving up to 130, he gets like first dibs on a title shot. And the title is going to be vacant. It is vacant. Why? Because Shakur Stevenson lost the, 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 the belt on the scales and he's moved up to 135. So there's no champion for the WBO right now. So Oscar Valdez, who's the former champion is going to be or is it was he the former champion i'm sorry i don't want to get the belts wrong no he was a former wbc champ i think all right but um oscar valdez and shakur steve i'm sorry shakur uh, emmanuel navarrete was gonna fight but now that oscar valdez has pulled out of the fight you got um what's this guy's name i put his name up because i'm not familiar with the two gentlemen all right so now that he's pulled up he's going to be fighting third ranked WBO challenger Liam Wilson all right from Australia all right he's 11 one and seven okay and he's a third rank and the reason why he was gonna get the fight is because for for whatever reason the the first ranked fighter Archie sharp who was going to fight Liam Wilson all right he's a first ranked fighter they were gonna fight each other because Oxter Valdez is the second ranked WBO fighter. Those two were gonna fight each other. But for whatever reason, Liam Wilson is gonna be fighting Navarrete for that vacant WBO title. Not Archie Sharp, who's number one. Why? I don't know. I got this report from the WB uh from the uh from the boxing scene. Okay, is a report made by Keith Eidek. And based on this report, it doesn't really explain why Archie is not getting the fight, all right? They said that they were supposed to be on the undercard of Jamel Charlo and Tim Zhu. That's going to be in January, all right? But whatever reason, Wilson is getting the fight over Sharp, okay? Now, let's speak on Oscar Valdez. Me personally, I don't know this for a fact. But I think his confidence really took a hit after the whole T situation, okay? What I mean by that is when he tests positive for a banned substance or of some sort back uh, before he fought Robson Conceso, all right? Had a tough fight with Conceso. I thought it was very close. Um, thought it was very, very close fight. All right, but I didn't think it was a robbery, though. I do think Valdez came back and won a, a good amount of rounds in the second half. All right, but what I will say is that I think his confidence kind of took a hit from that. All the backlash he got after that, he went from his highest 
moment earlier in the year by getting one of the craziest knockouts of the moment to going into that fight where you struggled in the fight and almost lost, in my opinion. Almost lost. All right? And a very co- tough fight with Conceso. And then you go into the short course Stevenson fight and you pretty much got outclassed. You know, I don't think you can really give uh, Valdez any more than two rounds in that fight. And um, we hasn't we haven't seen him in the ring since. You know, it's been uh, early in the year since he lost to Stevenson, and um, he got outclassed by Stevenson. And um, you know, going, you know, having a fight from um, Burchelt, knocking him out. He went from Burchelt to Conceição, all right, where you almost lost, close fight. Then going to Stevenson where you're outclassed and then going to a fight with Navarrete. Is he really injured? Maybe not. Regardless, that's one tough schedule to have. That's an extremely tough schedule. You know? Um, I really don't honestly, I really honestly think that he probably needs... He needs some a confidence booster. And I understand that he didn't get stopped by Stevenson or anything like that. But I think he needs a fight where it can boost his confidence. I think his confidence took a hit after that whole situation with the T. And I think he needs that confidence back. That's just my opinion. That's not on the news. That's not anything that was said, reported. There's no interview that's out there of him saying this. I just... Feel that he needs a confident booster and going into a Navarrete fight, another really, really tough fight. Fight that I'm not even sure if Oscar Valdez would be the favorite for that fight. You know, Navarrete might be a slight, slight favorite in that fight if that fight were to go down. You know? And Navarrete is a guy that's going to try to maul you. You know, he starts off really slow, but once he gets it going, it's kind of hard to stop him. You know, and he's a extreme, one of the best, definitely one of my personal favorite Mexican fighters in the sport. I've said this after Canelo. He's probably like second or third place for me. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, it's a tough scrap. Don't know if he feels confident enough to go right into that fight. Not right away. All right. Um. So let's move on to the next topic. Uh, what do we have here? Um, let's talk about Shakur Stevenson real quick. All right. Let's talk about Shakur Stevenson. All right. Since we're staying in a rotation of 126 to 135. 126 is, I mean, Shakur Stevenson seems to be having some issues of getting a next, a top tier uh, opponent for his next fight. All right. Um, he called out uh, Cruz, uh, Pitbull Cruz. You know, I think the, he was going to be a mandatory. All right, they try to mandate that fight. I forgot which sanctioning body. I believe the WBA, but I could be wrong. But they try to mandate the fight, and um, Cruz wasn't having it. All right, Cruz didn't want to take the fight at this time. I've always said to you guys that Pitbull shutting down Ryan, shutting down all of these other fights. Um, there's a good chance that they just might be holding him for a possible tank rematch just in case the Ryan Garcia talks fall apart. That's always what I predicted. I've even tweeted it and it was actually liked by Javante Tank Davis himself. This is of course before they announced the uh Hector Garcia fight. But I believe that Pitbull Cruz is kind of being saved. Having that big, big clash, good fight, good performance against Tank. Um a lot of people feel he won that fight. I don't, but I thought the fight was really close, um, and he went the distance with Tank. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, think that they wasn't expecting that performance, so people are rating him high because of that performance. But now, as it seems like every other fight that's challenging for him, they don't want to put him in the ring with any of these guys. All right, and then you had uh, William Cepeda. All right, who uh, Shakur called out recently on social media. You know, Cepeda had a great win against uh, Jojo Diaz, all right, beating him basically 
shutting him out. I think I gave Diaz one round, one round that he hurt Zapata in the mid mid round somewhere. And uh, this guy's a guy that's I love the fight with Shakur. I mean, this guy can easily throw a thousand punches uh, 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 in a fight, you know. So I think I like him. He's a big fighter at 135. I think it'd be a great challenge for Shakur. Shakur, you know, called him out. Um, Zapata respond. It's like, yo, send the contract. So I thought it was on after that. Shakur replied and, and, and sent the contract, you know, confirmed the contract was sent. And then Oscar De La Hoya came out of nowhere and saved this fighter saying, I want to build up my fighter's name first before these fights fight. It's too soon. So Zapata's out. That's saying Zapata ducked, but Oscar ducked for him <laughs> at the end of the day. And I say that often because I do think a lot of fights could be made, but their promoters don't want their fighters to fight certain fighters and oscar we already know how he moves oscar when it comes to building his fighters and getting him to not fight the top tier guys oscar is a master at matchmaking and finding the right times for for, for opponents for his fighters all right uh, we see that with jaime Magia a lot all right so he moves he so Zapata's out the picture and then george cambosos all right, he wanted the George Camposos fight. George doesn't want the fight. According to Shakur Stevenson on his Twitter, he said he called out George, and um, I guess somebody on Twitter like reached out to him and said, and then um, Shakur said something on the lines that, well, he turned the fight down as well. Well, George is coming off two losses. You know, are you really surprised? Big win against Teofimo Lopez. Um, big one of the biggest upsets of last year, I believe. But at the end of the day, he's not going to lose twice and then go straight into fighting Shakur Stevenson. You know, he's probably just wants to save his name at this point. He's not going to do it. You know, I'm I'm not even surprised. It's it's more like it's similar to Oscar Valdez and his situation. You fight Burchell, so can say so Stevenson, and you got to fight Navarrete at right after that. <laughs> coming off a loss too on top of that nah George is not going to fight Shakur Stevenson at the end of the day you know and I don't think there's any amount of money that they can offer George to do it without it being too much money you know George got paid a lot for those two fights with um, with uh, uh, Devin Haney you know he's just not going to come back and fight Shakur Stevenson just, it's not going to happen many of us probably think that the Shakur fight is going to be even more difficult than the Devin Haney fight you know, so with that being said, I'm not even mad at that. I'm not mad. It's just, I'm mad at Cruz. You know, I'm a little mad at Cepeda. Not really at Cepeda, but more like at, mad at uh, Oscar. But um, it is what it is. You know, it is what it is. All right? Um, but the main reason why I wanted to bring this up, and you guys that follow me on Twitter know my stance on this, I really want the Jermaine Ortiz fight. And I've been saying that since Jermaine Ortiz lost to Lomachenko. It was a very good performance from Jermaine Ortiz. He gave Lomachenko hell in there because of his hand speed and his volume. He's a great boxer, you know. Um, he has his flaws and all, but I would love for him to fight Shakur Stevenson. And I said after the fight with Lomachenko, I said, yeah, it's a loss. It's a loss to Loma, but that was a great performance. That was a very good performance. And I believe that if he didn't slow down at the point that he did, Loma might have lost that fight. Might have lost that fight. You know? But it is what it is. The pressure got to him and Loma started to take control of the fight. And he lost the fight. But it was a very close one. With that being said, I was cool with anybody at 135 to fight Jermaine Ortiz. Because I don't think he's an easy fight for anybody. Including Shakur Stevenson. You know? I think his speed alone brings some sort of issues causes some sort of issues might take you longer to get it together and and, and put the pressure on and, and, and start winning i think jermaine ortiz especially within the first five rounds or so shakur stevenson would have a little issues with him because of his speed now i could be wrong but if shakur continues because he's starting to look like a boogeyman at this point if he at 135 if he continues to have an issue finding the right opponent 
for his next fight, take this fight. It should be easy to make. Jermaine Ortiz is already with top rank. It's a great fight. And that's that. You know? And to piggyback off that, and I want to talk a little bit about Lomachenko and Devin Haney. Because Devin Haney wants to have a fight in May. Now, I said this earlier in a video, but I wanted to just go into that a little bit. Haney has an issue with top rank right now because they want to make the fight for, for May. He wants it in March. He says the longer that they draw out this fight, the harder it will be, able, it will be for him to make weight. We already know how he looked at the last weigh-in in the Cambosos rematch as opposed to the first Cambosos rematch. Devin Haney looked very, very drained at that weigh-in. I even went as far as saying that he will probably never fight at this division again after that fight. But he wants to remain at the division because he feels it's a lot of money to make there, which is which is true. And 140 will always be there, you know? Lomachenko, good fight, fight that we all wanted. Wasn't even expecting, even a performance against Jermaine Ortiz where Loma looked like he struggled a bit. I still was surprised that we're going to get this Devin Haney fight. I'm surprised that Devin Haney is going to stay at the division. But he wants the fight to happen at March. I mean, we're still, we're midway through December. I don't know why we have to wait until May. I don't know if it's because of scheduling issues, you know, with ESPN. I have no idea what the issue is. But Devin Haney wants to make the fight in March. Some people reading a couple of comments, people are gonna say that this is a this is just an a, a excuse to duck Lomachenko by wanting the fight a couple of months early. It's not like he's asking for the fight next month, you know, or early February, like Fury was doing um recently with Joshua and all these other fighters that he was trying to fight with, like Usyk. You know, he wanted Usyk in December when Usyk had just fought. No, he's asking for a fight in March. There's a whole nother three months until we get there. You know, we're midway through December. So unless there's some scheduling issues, I don't know why they can't make the fight for March. You know, at the end of the day, Devin could just drop the titles and go to 140 if they don't give him what he, what he wants. I mean, he doesn't have to fight. He's already undisputed. If he decides to drop the belts, then... Lomachenko won't have the opportunity to fight for Undisputed. So I think if Bob wants to do the right thing, make this fight happen in March like Haney wants. He is a champion. He is the A-side and all that shit that y'all like to talk about. He is that because at this point, he's the champion. All right? So make it work because we want the fight. And I know Devin Haney doesn't have a lot of time left to be at the division. So make it work for him. All right? I'm sure Lomachenko wouldn't have too much of a problem with that. All right? You have months. It's not even like you have you'll have a full 8 week camp. It shouldn't be an issue for either fighter. All right? Um and the last topic of the day and I just want to close this out. Well, let me not close it out. Let me not say close it out because I feel that there'll be more to discuss when it comes to this topic. But Crawford I made a video the other day, all right? And I made a video basically saying like, look, this isn't Crawford's fault. I think the commission and the WBO dropped the ball on the uh, Glovegate situation. Now, David Avenesian has officially filed a complaint against the commission and the WBO because of the outcome of this fight, all right? Um, he saw the pictures. He's reposted it on the social media. And obviously, he probably wants... The fight to be overturned, you know. I don't know how deep they can do as an investigation because there's people like myself. There's a difference on people that are against the call. There's people that's putting everything on Bud, claiming that Bud is cheating or his gloves were loaded or his gloves were tampered with in some kind of way. There's people that's going directly to that, and there's people that are. A little bit in the middle where I kind of place myself. I don't have a problem with Bud because I don't know. There's no proof that his gloves were tampered with at all. There's nothing to prove that. Now, even if you feel like 
why would both gloves just fall apart like that and have suspicions? There's nothing wrong with having suspicions. But to say like, yo, Crawford is cheating, his gloves were loaded, all of that stuff, there's no proof of that. I'm not there with that. What I am with is the commission dropping a ball on this whole situation. Why? Because there was a period where you noticed the glove was damaged in between rounds, right? Before the round started, the sixth round, before these guys drew a, a single punch, you paused the fight and you said, hey, get a spare pair of gloves. You know, we'll put them on. This is what actually was said. Get the spare. We'll put them on in the next round. The problem with that is Crawford got the knockout. It's not about whether you think the outcome of the fight would have been the same with or without the new gloves. It's eliminating the issue, eliminating the problem, eliminating these people that saying that Buzz Gross gloves were tampered with, eliminating David Avenition for filing a complaint and possibly having this fight overturn, overturned to a no contest. That's the way I'm thinking here. I'm not thinking about this guy's dirty, got that guy's dirty. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking about where the fight could have gone or would have gone. I know Crawford was going to stop David Avenition. At least I picked him to because he was a heavy favorite to do it. I wasn't expecting him to lose to David Avenition. That's not the point. Even the way that the knockout came, even with the way where the, the torns and the gloves were and the locations of the gloves, even if you feel it doesn't affect the fight, that's not the point. My point is, this can go bad, you know? Especially after 2020. We knew what happened with 2020. And that was based off a fight that happened to two years and two years prior. So what do you think is going to happen right now after a weekend, after a night of a fight where a guy is getting criticized left and right as much as he's getting criticized. I mean, he's at this point, he's getting criticized more than any other boxer currently fighting. Right now, it's all on Crawford. The Spence not fighting, Spence fight not, not, not happening, it's all on Crawford, you know? So with that being said, what we want to do, the commission wants to do, well, the commission should want to do, because it's their job to make sure that their safety Safety of the fighters is their job. It's not our jobs as, fan, as fans. It's not even the fighter's job. It's not up to... I read a comment. I think one of the, uh, the uh, supporters said, left a comment saying, you know, Bud should have just stopped. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not up to the fighters to say I'm going to stop because my glove is damaged. Bud clearly wanted wanted the knockout, and that's exactly what he did. They were told by the commission or the WBO, whoever represents them, whoever was on that side of the ring talking to the referee, they were told that they were going to swap the gloves in the next round. What did Crawford do? Crawford put a different level of pressure on that fight because he wanted to end the fight right there, and that's exactly what he did. He ended it in the sixth round. I'm not bluffing because we've seen it before. We've seen Bud get told something and he made a quick reaction by knocking out his opponent. So with that being said, David Avenisha has officially filed a complaint. And I won't be surprised if this get turned into a no contest. Now, will it change Bud's you know, at least, at least how I feel about Bud or how we saw we saw the knockout. We saw what happened. There's going to be some people that are suspicious that might lose some, you know, credit. Or he might lose credibility. I said this the other day. He might lose a little bit of credibility. He might lose some fans. But at the end of the day, we were all expecting that outcome. And he did exactly what he normally would do without glove mount. Uh, 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 defective gloves we see him do the same thing every fight you know and the places of where the gloves were cut his thumb here on the side 
Did it really affect it? No. But I, I think the right and safe thing to do was to put the gloves on right there. I know it would have changed the momentum of the fight. I know it would have pissed off the uh, viewers, you know, because they would have had to stop the fight. We know that people want this event to fail. They've been wanting it to fail since they heard about the event, being, since the, the event was announced. So they want to have things like this to feed off, but who cares? At the end of the day, yo, boxing fights get stopped all the time for silly stuff, stuff that's unexpected. At the end of the day, just do what you gotta do. Stop the fight, swap the gloves, and then we eliminate all of this stuff. David Avenetian would have got knocked out with a fresh pair of gloves. He can't file a complaint because you got knocked out with a fresh pair of gloves. You didn't get knocked out with the gloves that were damaged. But being that the commission, the commission saw the glove and allowed to fight to continue. Even if it's just one round, it only took one round to get the knockout. And now we are where we are. I think my stance is simple. I don't think we're all going to agree with it, and that's cool. But that's the way I look at it. The commission, the WBO, the Nebraska State Commission, they dropped the ball because they were in a position to pause everything. And if you look at the video, you will see that the gloves were already in hand by the time the fight was over. I don't know if they already had it. I didn't know if they had it. Or they ran back and got it and it took... But by the time Bud Crawford knocked out Avenition, whoever it was on T Crawford's team that stepped in the ring with the gloves in hand had them available in plastic, ready to go. They were in hand. So with that being said, really don't have a problem with Crawford. It's just the commission dropped the ball. Something that could have took held up maybe five minutes of our time would have changed this whole narrative of him having glo loaded gloves. Like I said to you guys the other day, it would have saved Crawford. It would have saved Avenesian. It would have saved the commission from the backlash. There wouldn't have been no backlash. But now we might possibly get a fight overturned. And then we get the black backlash at Bud. Some people say this backlash is good for his name. I don't think so. I think I understand where people are going because everybody's talking about Crawford nonstop. But for the people that are unfamiliar with Crawford, like a lot of a lot of casual fans that are just get into the sport and they're coming in and they're being told by someone that don't know what they're talking about, that this guy's a cheater, that this guy never fought anybody good. Do you want that on your name? I don't think so. I don't think you would want that. Some some people live through the controversy. Like I think Tyson Fury is a guy that loves the attention, the controversy. I don't think Bud feeds off the controversy in the, in the gossip. He's never been that guy. All right? So anyway, again, I apologize, guys, for not going live. Because I knew if I was going to go live, I'd probably be up on here for a really, really long time. But um, regardless, um, that's the this week's Wave Report, episode number two. Um, and I'll be back with more breakdowns. You already know. Again, Frank Martin, Michelle Rivera fight this weekend on Showtime. Very good fight. Be sure to check it out. I did a breakdown for the fight. Also, check out everybody else that's doing a breakdown. Any other channel that's doing content on actual fights coming up. Show them love. Show them support. Those are the real boxing channels. Not the gossip boxing channels. You know, give some love to those channels. If you're going to give some love to the gossip, I'm not hating on them. Give them love too. But show love to the guys that's actually like talking about the fights that's coming up. You know what I'm saying? Um... Yeah, so if you are new, subscribe to the channel, smash the like button, share the video if you could. And um, again, sorry for no live today, no live today, but um, I'll be back with some more content, more fire for y'all real soon. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.